harvest festivals. Some of you may remember the days when you went to the harvest festival. And of course it was a celebration of, uh, of the harvest season having come to an end. The, the, uh, the, the farmers had, had done the work and, and started early in the season and throughout the year cultivated and then, then uh, took care of the land and finally the crops came in. Those crops were harvested, uh, sent off to market and and now there was, there was a supply and abundance of, of God's blessing. And, and folks knew and folks understood that, that the harvest is a blessing from above, from God. And so there would be times of, of thanksgiving for God's blessing. Going all the way back, as you will remember in in your history lessons all the way back even to the time of the pilgrims as we call them. Uh, those first uh, migrants from, from England and Europe to, to this new world and, and the, the harsh conditions they, they found and yet at the, at the end of a, of a first harvest season uh, they, they had a blessing that only God could provide. And so, I want to kind of tie this message today to this understanding of, of, of how Thanksgiving and, and harvest festivals are, are tied to the earth, tied to the ground, tied to, to the, the produce which God provides by, by doing what, what we do to the earth. To, to the dirt. Okay, how are we going to tie this together? I'm glad you asked. Um, some of you are familiar with the writings of A.W. Tozer. And uh, he has some, some wonderful work on, on the attributes of God. Um, but in a different one of his, uh, in his writings that I came across this week, I want to share with you something that Tozer has to say about, about the earth, about the soil, uh, about the ground. And, and we're going to tie this into our text today. So here's what uh, Tozer says in Paths to Power. Tozer writes, there are two kinds of ground. Fallow ground and ground that has been broken up by the plow. The foul ground is smug, content, protected from the shock of the plow and the agitation of the harrow. Such a field as it lies year after year becomes a familiar landmark to the crow and the blue jay. Safe and undisturbed, it sprawls lazily in the sunshine, the picture of sleepy contentment. Fruit, it can never know, because it is afraid of the plow and the harrow. In the direct opposite to this, the cultivated field has yielded itself to the adventure of living. I love how he says that. Has, has uh, yielded itself to the adventure of living. The protecting fence has opened to admit the plow, and the plow has come, as plows always come, practical, cruel, businesslike, and in a hurry. Peace has been shattered by the shouting farmer and the rattle of machinery. The field has been upset, turned over, bruised and broken, but its rewards come hard upon its labors. The seed sprouts up into the daylight. It's miracle of life, curious, exploring the new world above it. Nature's wonders follow the plow. He continues, there are two kinds of lives. The fallow 
and the cloud. The man of fallow life is content with himself and the fruit he once bore. He does not want to be disturbed. He smi smiles in silent superiority at revivals, fastings, self-searching, and all the travail of fruit-bearing and the anguish of advance. The spirit of adventure is dead within him. He has fenced himself in and by the same act has fenced out God and the miracle. The plowed life is the life that has thrown down the protecting fences and sent the plow of confession into the soul. Such a life has put away defense and has forsaken the safety of death to, for the peril of life. Discontent, yearning, contrition, courageous obedience to the will of God, these have bruised and broken the soil till it is ready again for the seed. And as always, fruit follows the plow. Again, the words of A.W. Tozer. The prophet Isaiah had the, the difficult task of proclaiming, of preaching, of prophesying the word of God to the people of his day. Much of what Isaiah had to prophesy was disaster. <clears throat> was coming judgment. Was, was the coming wrath of God. And yet, scattered throughout this wonderful book of Isaiah are, are these nuggets of hope that, that always happen within, within these prophecies of God that that, that's trying to, to get God's people to turn from the direction they're going back to God. The point of, of the prophecy is to say if, if you keep living the way you're living, you're not going to produce what God wants to produce in your life. If you're going to produce something, you're going to produce the fruits of the wrath that comes from disobedience. will turn and will repent. We can enjoy God's blessing and fruitfulness. Sometimes, and probably more than just sometimes, that process of really getting on page with God, really getting where God wants us to be, is a difficult road to hoe. And that's exactly how Isaiah, in this prophecy he, he receives from the Lord to, to proclaim to the people, is exactly how he begins Isaiah 12 in verse 1. He says, and in that day, you're going to want to thank God. In that day, you're going to want to shout to the Lord praise. In that day, you're going to have thanksgiving in your heart. But that day it is after you've gone through some things to get there. How many of you have gone through some difficult times in life? I'll put up, let me just put up both hands, right? You know, how many of you, you know, look at those difficult days and, and, and really understand that that God doesn't miss an opportunity. The good, the, the bad, the really bad, and sometimes even what we think is mediocre, you know, God doesn't miss an opportunity in our lives. And God certainly uses and even sometimes puts into our lives His discipline to move us from where we are and to till up the fallow ground of the heart. So Isaiah <laughs> prophesies, he says, in that day, you're going 
going to thank God. You're going to sing His praise. But it's not going to be before some, some difficult days. Because He says along with that, you're going, to, you're going to give thanks to God. Why? For though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Yeah, that, that, that's the prayer of thanksgiving in many of our lives. As we look back on, on the struggles, and, and in fact, you may be right in the middle of some of the most difficult days of your life. But do you ever stop to think that, that God is working in this situation? To move me from, from where I am to, to where He wants me to be. Now you may already be in a good place with God, but as we've talked about many times before, there's, there's always a, a deeper place with Him. There's always a, a higher height with Him. There's always more that, that He wants to give that, that we may not have yet been ready to receive. And God will use the circumstances of your life. And on the other side, you'll look back and, and you'll say, Thank God that you walked me through that. When David writes of, of walking through the valley of the shadow of death, that doesn't sound like a very pleasant place to, to trod. This doesn't sound like a very happy place to be. And yet David uses that to help us remember that, that God is the shepherd moving and, and, and walking with us and ahead of us and, and taking us to new places, places of, of green pasture and places of, of blessing, but not that even, even in that, that valley of shadow of doubt, we can't say there's no blessing there because thou art with me. And anytime God's with me, there's a blessing in that. And so we think this time of year about Thanksgiving. And sometimes it's, it's hard to, to thank God for the plow that He plows up through our lives and turns some, some fallow ground upside down. As told you said, it, it hurts. It bruises. It's not comfortable. <coughs> God never misses the opportunity to till us up and make us useful. And as in Jesus' parable of, of the, the soils, to, to make our, our soil of our heart receptive to the Word so that it can spring forth and, and it can grow and it can produce the fruit. And so we have this wonderful chapter in Isaiah, just six verses, in which he begins in that day. In that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. Again, just as a reminder, and I said this earlier, some of your translations use the word praise. In that day, I will praise the Lord. The Hebrew word there is a word that can be translated either way. But, but when we praise the Lord, is, is there not reason behind that? Don't we always praise God because of something? God, I, I praise you because what you did in my life. I praise you because you delivered me from this. I praise you because you saved my soul. I praise you because... But aren't those praises praises of thanksgiving? And that's why this particular Hebrew word is is one and the same. It, it, it can be translated either way. That's the Hebrew word yada. Yada can be translated according to how its, it, it's uh, verb form is. It can be translated in a lot of ways, but primarily in Scripture, this word is used over a hundred times in the Hebrew text, in the Hebrew Old Testament. A hundred times this word is used. And the vast majority of those times is of praise and thanksgiving. Praise and thanksgiving. In that day, 
I will give thanks to you, O Lord. For though you were angry with me because you know, I have sinned and there's sin in my life. And, you know, the, the thing about sin is that God doesn't, God doesn't hate the sinner. God loves the sinner. But God hates sin. Scripture is very clear. God hates sin. And sometimes we get that confused in, in our society today. A lot of people throw that word hate around. Well, you're just a hater because you don't, you know, you don't subscribe to, to this lifestyle or, or that lifestyle and, and you preach against this or you preach against that. You're just a hater. No, I, I'm not a hater. Unless you're talking about the sin in the life. Then I'm going to be right there with God. I, I want to hate the sin. And, and, I'm, and I'm compelled to preach against it because it's the sin that, that separates us from God. But God's heart is, it is to, to, to use the plow in your life to bring you back in line with His plan and His purpose for your life. <clears throat> so that you can confess your sin, repent, and get right with God and be useful. In fact, in that day, that day of rejoicing, that day of, of praise and, and thanksgiving, um, there's, a, there's a way that, that we praise God. <clears throat> So, so first, you know, it's appropriate to give thanks to God for His discipline. You know, it's okay to say, God, thank You for, you know, doing some things in my life that weren't very comfortable. You, you know, have you ever experienced the discipline of God? Not only though does, does God discipline, but the point of His discipline is to bring us to a place, and certainly the sinner to a place of salvation. Look at, look at verse 2. Behold, God, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. Here's point number two for you, so you'll get that. It's appropriate to declare God's attributes. What are some of the attributes that, that Isaiah is saying are, are attributes of God when it says God is? Alright? We know in the New Testament we find God is love. That, that's, that's an attribute of His being. It's descriptive of, of who He is. So what does Isaiah say about who God is? Behold, God is my salvation. So, so an attribute of God is, is that He is in a saving work to redeem us and bring us back to Himself. It's a wonderful attribution of God that, that He wants to save us. He doesn't want to abandon us. But He has done everything necessary to bring life, eternal life, saving grace. And not only that, the Scripture says, um, Behold, God is my salvation. I, I will trust, I will not be afraid. So, so if, God is, uh, if God is your Savior, who shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? The scripture says. But get the next part of this. For the Lord God, or the Lord Jehovah, is, there's that word is again, because it's going to be descriptive. It's an attribute of who, who He is. What is He? The Lord God, or the Lord Jehovah, is my strength. So, so God is not only my salvation, but He's the strength that, that keeps me in this life, that keeps me going through this, this Christian life, that when the, the plow's churning and I'm ready to give up, 
And I turn back to him and say, God, I, I don't know if I can make it another day, much, much less, a, you know, another minute. The Lord is thy strength. The Lord is my strength. What else is the Lord? The Lord is my song. The Lord is my song. Have you ever thought of God, of the Lord God Almighty being your song? Has that ever occurred to you? The Lord is my song. Now, oftentimes when, uh, when we have a, a cheerful heart, we have a joyful heart, there's often a, a melody of our lives that begins to, to ring out. Have you ever caught yourself, you know, in, maybe in a good situation, you're, you're having a good day, things are going well, and you got a hum, you got a, a, a humming a tune of some kind, you either out loud. Uh, has anybody ever had to, to tell you, hey, uh, you know, you get too loud over there. You know, quit singing your song. Um, I don't know if this is true of you. I, I can't I can't get in your mind. I, I can't really know how uh, if whether or not this is true of you, but I'm just telling you something that's true of me. Um there are days, lots of days, and I can't say every day and always, but there are days, many days, that literally, when I roll out of bed in the morning, my feet hit the floor, there is a song that's playing like a record player, like, you know, we used to call it record players, right? The old record player. Well, you know, um, I guess today it was like lock an MP3. <laughs> you know? There's a song that's playing in my mind. Do you ever wake up like that? Um, and you know, for me, now, and, and oftentimes it's the kind of music you listen to. It's the kind of music you listen to. And I, I listen pretty exclusively to, uh, you know, to Christian music. And, and so there's, there's songs that, that I'll wake up to in the morning and, and, and I'll think, you know, the Holy Spirit of, of God put that in my heart. There's no real reason for me to be singing that particular song or as I jump up in the morning, but, but the song's playing in my mind and, and I'm hearing because because God is my song. He's my strength. He's my salvation. He's my song. So Isaiah says in that day, and you're going to have thanksgiving in your heart. You're going to look back on your life and, and you're going to realize God has led you through some difficult times. He's put the plow to your life, but it was a good thing even though it was hurtful. And He became your salvation. He became your strength. He became your song. In verse 3, with, with that joy in your heart, you draw from the well of salvation. Because God just keeps... Given as we keep drawing up. Part of our problem, the reason we lose joy in our lives is we quit, we quit going to the well. Don't stop going to the well. God's well is a well of salvation. You say, well, I'm already saved. But we've talked about this many times before. Don't forget that, that salvation has different components. There's the justification. I have been saved. Um, I will always be saved because God has justified me by the blood of Jesus, not my own righteousness, but His, and has covered my sin so that now I am a child of God and have everlasting life. I am saved. But you know what else? I am being saved. Sanctification. Being sanctified. Being molded and, and made into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ so that I, I think more like Him and I act more like Him and I talk more like Him than I used to. Be more like Jesus today than you were yesterday. Keep going to the well of your salvation. If you feel dry, go to the well. 
Lost your joy? Go to the well. If you don't have thanksgiving in your heart, go back to the well. <coughs> Never-ending supply of God's salvation, His grace. We'll move through these last ones kind of quickly. So strap your seatbelt in. In verse 4, you will say again in that day, give thanks or, or praise the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that His name is exalted. Point number three in your outline, it's appropriate to declare God's wondrous deeds. Think about what He's done in your life. You're going to, to, to thank Him and, and praise Him for, for His salvation. You're going to sing the song of, of His praise because of what He's done in your life. You know, my, my favorite hymn, Blessed Assurance. You know, the chorus of that, this is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Why? Because of all that He's done. I, I want to I declare God's deeds. I, 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 want, I want you all to know that God is good. And I want you to, to make sure that, that you're telling others God is good. And that goes right into our, our next verse. Um. Our next point, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, point number four, it's appropriate to let the whole world know. It's appropriate to let the whole world know. Look at uh, verse five. So, sing praise to the Lord, for He has done gloriously. I like how the ESV you know, uses that word gloriously. In the King James, He has done excellent things. Now, in the King James, you have this phrase, this is known in all the earth. This is known in all the earth. When we go back and we look at that in, in the Hebrew text, uh, there's a sense that um, it's more about making it known than the fact that it's already known. If it was already known to the ends of the earth, God's goodness, His greatness. Every time for Jesus to come. Every time for Him to just come back. Because the good news is spread to the ends of the earth. But, um, but a way that this, uh, this text from the Hebrew can be translated, and the way that the ESV has it this way, let this be made known in all the earth. It kind of captures the Hebrew that, that yes, it, it's known, it's known among us, but we want to go make it known to the ends of the earth. And so we sing His praise. We tell Him His good deeds because of all that He's done for us, and we want the whole world to know. I mean, that is our great commission, right? We don't keep this good news to ourselves, do we? The Great Commission is, is to go and, and tell this good news. So we sing to the Lord. For He has done excellent things. He has done gloriously. And we want to make it known to all the world. And, and finally in verse 6, He just says, Shout and sing. Cry out. It's almost like, this Thanksgiving is bubbling up in me so much so that, that I can't contain it. I've got to let this thing out. Cry out and shout. Sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. You see, when you get, when you get filled up with the, the Spirit of God, and you get filled up with thanksgiving in your heart. And you get filled
filled up with, with, with thoughts of, of, of his salvation and, and, his, and his strength and, and the song that's in you, you, you can't help it but burst forth when, and tell the world and let the world know. But we want the world to know that we have a holy and awesome God. And He's here in our midst. In the New Testament, Jesus says, where two or three or more are gathered, He is in the midst. So we have much to be thankful for. But maybe more than anything else in life that we should be thankful for is the fact that He is with us. In all of His holiness, in all of His glory, in all of His perfect righteousness, He has chosen to dwell among us. Sinners saved by grace. So it is appropriate, number five, to be in complete awe in His presence. Sometimes I'm torn when, when I'm praising, when I'm worshiping the Lord. I, I, I want to shout it out to the world, and at the same time I want to be on my face before a holy God. <laughs> it's kind of hard to do both at the same time. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just in awe of, of who He is and what He's done in my life. And, and then He's, he's saying to us that He's done all these things that we're, we're thankful for. And, and even the fact that he's, he, he's put the plow in my life and he's, he's turned some things over and, and He's drawn me back to Himself and He's saved me and put a song in my heart and, and all these things. I want to shout that out to the, the world. And, and then I realize He's a holy God. He is a holy God. And I'm not worthy to, to stand in His presence. But thanks be to God. Thank God we have a Savior whose blood covers our sin. And we can come boldly before the throne of grace to receive His mercy in our time of need. Got much to be thankful for. I'm asking to bow your heads.